And uh, for that, you made up some solutions. You then figured out what the acid to base ratio was. So you calculated the acid to base ratio. And uh, if I remember correctly, the acid to base ratio was 5 to 1. Is that right? 5 to 1. Uh, so that was, you had a pKa of 7.2. And uh, the pH should have been 6.5. Is that right? Yeah, I think that uh, that was that. Uh, by the way, uh, just a quick recap. With these constellations, pKa of 7.2 and pH of 6.5, is that a good range for the buffer? Yeah? Because we said it is a good range for the buffer because we said a good range would be plus minus 1 of the pKa. So in this case, the, a good range for this buffer would be between 6.2 and 8.2. That's the, the bracket um, of, the, of, the, of this buffer. And then you had 25 milliliter of the acid. And uh, when you did this uh, calculation... Uh, it was basically, you should use five parts of the acid and one part of the base. So you should have added around five milliliter of base. And this should have given you a pH of 6.5. Yeah? Is that, is that right? Did anyone get 6.5? Some people said uh, they did bang on 6.5, but not many. So, um, did anyone get anything else than 6.5? Yeah? So, I assume that since nobody put their hand up when I asked if you got it, most of you didn't get it. Why? What do you think could be the problem? Any ideas? You are absolute. Well, ooh. this equation, the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, is pretty accurate. Yeah? It's pretty accurate. However, you are, you are going in the right direction. Because all the equations that we are dealing with are meant for an ideal solution. So all, all equations valid only for what is called an ideal solution. What do I mean by ideal solution? An ideal solution is when the individual components in the solution do not interact at all with each other. There's no interaction between the different ions and, and, and water molecules and, and things like that. And an ideal solution would be an infinite dilution, basically, where you know, the molecule sitting next to you doesn't do anything. But we are operating not with ideal solutions. We are operating actually with real-life solutions where the molecules bump into each other and where maybe a cation might be attracted to an anion. So there's a short time of, of interaction going on. And that's why, these, so why, why all of these equations are only some kind of approximation. So in, in a case... You are right by saying it's not exact. You would have to use what is called an activity factor if you were to try and calculate this absolutely 100% correct. So that is the reason 
We are not dealing with ideal solutions. That is the reason why you didn't get exactly 6.5, as you should have. Another problem, of course, is you have to weigh in the substances, the potassium and the sodium uh, phosphate. And uh, there were certainly some errors. So these errors also have manifested its, uh, themselves in this difference. So you should, however, you should have got something around between 6.0 and probably 6.8. Did anyone get anything between 6.0 and 6.8? Hands up. So most of you hopefully got that. Okay, so you did this experiment, and the message that you should learn from that is never, ever, under any circumstances, in a laboratory setting, trust your calculations. The calculations are there to give you a rough estimate in which range you are. Right? But if you are dealing with a buffer, you will always have to check that the buffer is right. So you always have to check that it shows the right pH. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, I know of some people who forgot to do that, who said, oh, my calculation is so good, uh, no problem. And then when you look at your pH, you are out by one and a half pH units and... Um, you think, oh, shoot, I should have checked that. That explains why my experiment didn't go well. And, um, yeah, let's put it this way. My PhD supervisor wasn't ecstatic uh, of me burning 900 quid uh, worth of uh, substances uh, just by forgetting to double-check the pH. And I wasn't happy. Okay, so that was one thing. Yesterday, and uh, you then uh, moved on to a different experiment where you diluted the buffer. And it was, it was quite entertaining to count the number of people who came to me and said, I need a larger beaker. Because the instruction was take... 12 milliliter of your uh, phosphate buffer, so 12 milliliter of the 6.5 uh, buffer, diluted 10 times and then measure the pH. And they said, oh, I need a large beaker for that. And the first time when somebody came to me, well, I was, um, why? Why do you need a larger beaker? Uh, they say, well, I've got 12 milliliters and I have to dilute it uh, tenfold. So I need more volume. And I said, actually, alternatively, what you could do is you could just take a little bit of this and dilute that ten times. Yeah? It's exactly the same. And if we want to dilute something ten times then obviously we would use one part of that plus how many parts of the other one, of water? Ten? Nine. Why nine? Why ten? Ah, okay. I see you thinking. You said nine. Why? This is how you are, okay, but you can't remember why. So what does 10 times dilution mean? We have to dilute something 10 times. But we have to make a 1 in 10 dilution. 1 in 10 dilution. This is probably a little bit 
closer to, to, to the answer. What does 1 in 10 mean? How many parts do you have in total? If it is 1 in 10, it means you have 10 parts in total. Exactly. Yes? So you have 10 parts in total. So 10 parts in total. One of these parts is already booked by your substance. How much of water do you need then? Nine. Exactly. So it's one part plus nine parts of water. So when you are asked to dilute something, one in ten, it is one plus nine. Because together it should make up ten. How about two plus eighteen? Would that work? How many do we have in total? 20. So 20 in total. How many are booked by the substance? 2 in 20 is the same as 1 in 10. Yeah? 5 plus 45. Same? Yeah? So you can take 5 milliliters of your buffer and 45 milliliters of water. Don't need a big, big beaker for that. You can easily measure 50 milliliters. So I want you to really get to understand this concept. 1 in 10 means 1 plus 9. 1 in 100 How many do you need in total? You need 100 in total, yeah? 1 in 100. How, many, how much is booked by, by your substance? 1. So how much of the water do you need? 99, exactly. 1 plus 99, yeah? 1 in 45. <laughs> how much water? 44, exactly. Three point seven in twenty. So you need, you are absolutely right, three point seven plus sixteen point three, because that gives you a total of twenty. Yeah? Make sense? Fantastic. So you did this experiment and... Oh, oh sorry. I thought you, you have a question. Um, so you did this experiment. You diluted your buffer. What did you find? Did it change dramatically? No. And we mentioned that yesterday in, 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 the, in the lecture... The reason what happens is, in your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, pH equals pKa minus log of moles acid per volume divided by moles of base per volume, It's just simply the concentration written in a slightly different form. If you change the volume, if you, if you increase this volume by a factor, let's say, 10, uh, then you also increase this by a factor of 10, and it still cancels it, uh, itself out. So the characteristic of a buffer is that they are not susceptible to dilution. So if you dilute a buffer or not, it doesn't make a huge difference to it because the change in volume will cancel each other out. 
Unfortunately, there are some buffers that are slightly dilution dependent. And this comes back to the, this weird issue that the ions start to interact with each other. So the activity change slightly. And again, therefore, when you dilute a buffer, you always have to check that the pH is still what you think it is. Yeah? So that was with this stuff. And you probably noticed that there are slight changes in the pH, but they are not dramatic. So a phosphate buffer usually does not lead to any dramatic pH changes when you dilute it. There are other buffers, as I said, uh, that are not so benign, but phosphate buffer is more or less all right. Okay, and then you did the experiment with the phosphoric acid. And this is where I have to apologize. I, 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 I told you uh, a little bit of nonsense, for which I apologize, but obviously nobody has picked it up, uh, which is good. Uh, obviously, I'm a very good bullshitter. <laughs> um, so what you did was actually... You measured the pH, and you added some sodium hydroxide. Is that right? Sodium hydroxide. And what you saw at the beginning, you probably had a pH of, what was it, 2-ish or so, 1.7 or so in, in, in that range. And what you saw is that the pH slowly crept up. It was a little bit like that, yeah? And then at one point, it made a huge jump. Is that right? Um, hang on. That's not right. And then you saw something like that and another jump. Yeah? What is going on here? My mistake was I told you that uh, there should be a jump down here. Actually, probably not. So my mistake, my bad. Uh, there shouldn't be a jump there. But you, there, there should be in total three jumps. Um, you probably have only seen two, and that's fine. The third jump is actually not down here. The third jump is when you have loads and loads of uh, sodium hydroxide, which we didn't do. So... Forget what I said, that uh, a jump should be here. There should be a third jump over here in this direction. And I apologize for that. But let's have a look what's going on. So at the beginning, when we have no, no sodium hydroxide added, what happens? Well, we have our phosphoric acid. H3PO4. And of course, this phosphoric acid can give off a proton. So we have H plus plus H2PO4 minus. Phosphoric acid is actually not a terribly strong acid. So, it doesn't really dissociate completely into the H plus and the, uh, and the H2PO4 minus. There's always a little bit of this guy and this guy. So, let's call this the acid and let's call this the conjugate base. Yep. What are we going to have when we have an acid and the conjugate base present at the same time? What is this? It's a buffer. Exactly. Yeah, it's a buffer system. So therefore, we have a buffer. And for a buffer system, 
When you think buffer, think Henderson Hasselbalg. pH equals pKa minus log of the acid over base. Yeah? Happy with that? That's even without us adding any sodium hydroxide. Okay, now let's add sodium hydroxide. So what happens to this henderson hasselbalch equation? What's happening to the acid? Well, we take away acid when we add sodium hydroxide, and we add to the base. So we can write this in a way, pH equals pKa minus log of acid, but we are taking away from the acid minus, the, minus some of the hydroxide that we add. That's what we take away from it. And for the base, plus the hydroxide that we add. Yeah? So it's a slightly extended equation. And in a way that, that, that allows you to calculate it, what is the pH in this case? Yeah? That makes sense? Right. Let's do that for some time. We add more and more of this B, more and more B. What happens to this ratio acid to base? It, yeah? It turns, it can turn negative, exactly. That was where you, where you looked so scared yesterday. Yeah? It can turn, it, it, before it turns negative, what happens? Acid minus B could be? Could be? Could be? Acid minus B could be, before it turns negative? Could be zero, yes? What happens to your log? You have log zero divided by something. What is log zero? <laughs> the calculator waves a white flag and says, sorry, no can do. It's Friday morning, and uh, you know, it would do the same on a Sunday night. Um, can't do it. This is actually, when does this actually happen? It happens when the amount of acid is the same as the amount of B. Yeah? Then the, yes? That is the, the, bay, the, the, the sodium hydroxide that I add. Yeah? I don't want to call it base because then it gets confusing with the other one. So when I have exactly the acid amount, the amount of acid that I have is the same as the sodium hydroxide amount, then I get zero. And the whole thing falls completely apart. So this is when acid is equivalent to NaOH. Then something catastrophic happens. And you see this in your graph. The catastrophe is denoted by this point here. At this point, everything falls to pieces and you have a massive jump. This point here, actually, is called the equivalence point. That means, at this particular amount of sodium hydroxide, I have the equivalent of the protons that are in this buffer. Yeah? Does that make sense? This is called the equivalence point. 
it's not necessarily neutral. You got this equivalence point, um, can't remember, but it definitely wasn't seven. Yeah? So it's not necessarily neutral, it can be anything, but where it makes this jump halfway, by definition, this is where you have the same amount of acid and hydroxide added. Yeah? What happens if you actually just add enough hydroxide so that you get half of the acid. So when you start off with your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you have lots and lots of acid and only a little bit of the base because only a little bit has dissociated. But what happens if you add more and more base? What happens if you have a point where acid minus B is the same as the base plus B? What would happen in this case? Loud? You have the same pH as you have the pKa. Why? Because you have pH equals pKa minus log this one divided by this one, right? And that would give you one. Now, when do we reach this point where we have acid minus B equals, equals base, base plus B? Well, actually, when we have added exactly half of the amount of the hydroxide that we require to reach the equivalence point. So if we have here our equivalence point, half of that, this one here, that would give us the midpoint, if you like, and the corresponding pH this here is our pKa. Yeah? So in a way, even if you have an unknown acid, you can find out what the pKa of this acid is by doing this titration. You go to the equivalence point, that's this one here, you take half of it, look at your graph, and you find the pKa. Just by playing around with the henderson hasselbalch equation. <coughs> Amazing stu stuff. I'm not going to ask you that in, uh, uh, in an assessment or, or anything like that. I just wanted to, uh, to tell you that uh, you can actually do that. And of course, you have eliminated here in the phosphoric acid only one proton, only the first proton. Here, you find another equivalence point. This is when the second proton is gone. And again, you can determine another pKa, that's pKa2, that was pKa1, something like that here somewhere, very precise, um, where you get the second pKa. That is when the second proton is gone. And of course, you can strip then the third proton, but you need a lot of uh, uh, sodium hydroxide 
And that would be then around, so this was around 2.3, that is 7.2, and the last one I think is 12.7 or so. So that's why if you, if you, have, if you ha had you done it until the bitter end, you would have seen that you have three jumps. But two jumps, that's good enough, that indicates that here you at least stripped two protons. Does that make sense? Fantastic. And of course, then, there were the comprehensions. One of the comprehensions we have done already with the buffer, uh, what happens when you dilute it. The other one was a little bit with calculation. Just have to find the right thing. Okay, so a lot of stuff here. And obviously, you want to make up a complex buffer. The easy bit is the salt, for example. Let's quickly do the salt so that you get a feel for it. So you want to have one liter of buffer. And this buffer should contain zero point two five molar of salt. And salt has a molecular mass of what? Can't see it. Fifty-eight point four doesn't have a unit here because it says relative. So you always have to think about well, that's gram per mole. Okay. Happy with that? Um, and this is a is a very familiar thing. We can do it with dimensional analysis. So what? What is the unit that we are looking for when we ask how much of the salt do we need? What's the unit? It's grams. Do we have grams anywhere? 58.4 gram per mole. Gram is good, but we want to get rid of the mole. Do we have mole anywhere? Yes, it's in here, 0 0.25 mole per liter. Mole is good because they cancel each other out. Do we have liter anywhere? Yep, we have one liter. And now the liters cancel out uh, as well. And we get, what did I get? Can anyone quickly do that? 15... 14.6. So we need 14.6 gram in this case. I don't know, have people uh, used the um, um, equation triangle? Does that look familiar to some people? Yeah? Who hasn't used something like that? You haven't used it? Some people haven't used it. OK. But the majority have used that. Do you feel comfortable with an uh, equation triangle? Sort of. Uh, because that's a different way. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I think I've posted um, the uh, equations for uh, molarity or so, which also contain the equation triangles. That is just an alternative way of uh, dealing with these calculations. Uh, if you haven't used it, don't worry about it. But if you have, 
this is probably a, a, a different way. And uh, all I want to say is, you know, please use it uh, if you feel more comfortable instead of dimensional analysis. Or use the, 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 the equations. It's absolutely fine with me. Yeah? Whatever you want. Right. Now, that was, that was the easy bit. That was the salt. You can do the same with the EDTA. But the tricky bit comes with the buffer. Because our job is, if we, if we translate that, we have to make up one liter of buffer. The pH should be 6.5. The pKa is 7.2. And the capacity of the buffer should be 0 0.1 molar. That means acid plus base should be total 0 0.1 molar. Yeah? That is what this, what this here says. First of all, step one, and I've, I've, uh, I did a video with the, with the five steps, the five golden steps to making buffers. Step one, before you get your calculator out, do we need more acid or more base? More acid? Who thinks more acid? Hands up. Why more acid? You are right. Why more acid? Yeah. The pH is lower than the pKa. Yeah? And therefore, if pH is lower than pKa, we need more acid. So that's our, our rule. So we need more acid. And here's a little tip for an exam or uh, a test or so. If you write this down in the first place, more acid than base, and then you make a mistake somewhere else in calculation, I know at least that you have thought about it and you will get marks. If you don't write that down, and you, you, you F up somewhere, well, the, the whole thing is wrong, really. But it also helps you to see, oh, I got 500 times more base in my calculation, but at the beginning I said I need more acid. Hang on, there's something weird going on. So you know that you can go back, bless you, you and again, uh, you go back and just simply figure out where did I make this mistake. And usually it's just a, you, you mixed up the ratios. Okay? So that's the first step. The second step is calculate the ratio. And in this case, we have done that before. pH equals pKa minus log acid to base. And you have done that in the practical. So you found that the acid to base ratio equals 5 over 1. You need 5 times more base, than, uh, 5 times more acid than you need base, which is in line with our step one. Step three. Step three. Let's calculate the amount of phos phosphate that we need. So, mole 
phosphate that we need. So we know that we should make one liter which contains 0 0.1 molar of phosphate. How many moles do we need? So we can do that with uh, dimensional analysis again. So let's calculate the mole. Do we have mole anywhere? Yep, we have 0 0.1 mole per liter. Mole is good, but the liter has to go away, so we need to multiply it by the liters. Okay? And that gives us, we need actually 0 0.1 mole of phosphate. In step four, we set up equations. The first equation is acid to base equals 5 to 1. And the second equation is acid plus base equals 0 0.1 mole. Okay? These are the two equations that we need to go further. And now what we can do is we can say, okay, acid actually equals 5 times base. And we can put that in here. So we have 5 times base plus base equals 0 0.1 mole. Yeah, does that make sense? You, you, you got that, how I, how, how I get to that. And instead of 5 times base plus another base, I can write 6 times base, 6 bases, equals 0 0.1 mole. So now I can calculate... How many moles of the base do I need? So, let me write this. 6 times base equals 0 0.1 mole or base equals uh, 0 0.1 mole over 6. That is... Can somebody do the honors? Equals 0 0.0116? 1, 7. 0 0.16. Okay, good, if you say so. Mole. Yeah? Sorry? 0 0.1 divided by 6. I beg, I beg your pardon? 0 0.16. Ha, yes. 0 0.167. Yeah? Good. Thank you. <laughs> and likewise, I can immediately calculate how many moles of acid I need. Acid equals 0 0.1 minus... 0 0.0167 mole, which is 0 0.083. Right? Have I done that right? Good. 
So this now tells me how many moles of the acid and the base I need. And the last step, step number five, is convert the moles into grams. And for that, I need the molecular mass of the individual components. Yeah? So these are the five golden steps. I can even check at this point here whether it makes sense because in step one I said I need more acid than base. So I need 0 0.0167 base and 0 0.08 eight mole of the acid, so acid is still more than the base, so I know I have done it right. Are you happy with that? And the rest, that is something for the for biochemical pedestrians, uh, you know, convert the mole into grams, and I trust that you can do that. Once you've done that, you mixed all the components together. You put them in around, say, 800 milliliters of water. You dilute them and make the solution. Why only 800? You should have one liter. You are asked to make one liter, but why do you do it only in 800 in the first place? To dissolve it, yes. Why don't you dissolve it in one liter? You have to take into consideration the solute. Uh, yes, so you need to say loud again? So you have to take into consideration of the amount of the solute being diluted. Uh, yes, uh, so if you've got lots of uh, salt volume, you can't take it uh, in, uh, in, a, uh, in a liter. You have to make it up to a liter. But why do you make it only up to 800 or so in the first place? What did I tell you earlier about checking the pH? Yeah? You have to check the pH because there could be substances in it that change the pH. Also, this ratio that you calculated is only for ideal solutions. But we don't have an ideal solution here. So, once you have made it up to, say, 800, you have to check the pH. Yeah? How would you, what would you do if the pH was, let's say, pH equals 7. What would you add? More acid? Be careful with more acid because it might change the amount of phosphate that's in it. Yeah? So you would probably not necessarily take a phosphoric acid. What else could you use? That? What? Can you use another acid where you've got lots of stuff in it? What have you got in it? You've got 0 0.5 molar salt, NaCl. Why don't you use HCl, which is a strong acid? It might change the chloride ions a little bit but not terribly, yeah? So you could bring the pH down with HCl. What happens if the pH is, say, 6? How do you bring it up? You add a very strong base. What would be an ideal base for that? NaOH, yeah? So you can adjust the buffer, and once you have adjusted the buffer to pH 
you can bring up the solution to one liter. Yeah? What do you have to do then? What, have to, what do you have to do then when you've got one liter of your solution? Last step. Check the pH again, yeah? Because you did a little bit of dilution and it could have changed again. Make sense? Somehow, somehow I have it in the waters that this would make a fantastic exam question. Right? Any questions? I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I shall see you on Monday.